All right, we'll call the January 22nd select board meeting to order. Bill, would you leave us on the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first order of business is to approve the January 8th, 2018 work session, non-public, and regular session, regular meeting minutes. I move that we uh, approve uh, the uh, um, January 8th, non-public and public meeting minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Select board will meet on the following dates. The regular meeting, Monday, February the 12th, and February the 26th at 6 p.m. The first public hearing, Wednesday, January the 24th at 6 p.m. to discuss the FY1819 budget. The special town meeting will be Wednesday, January 31st, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. located at the Plymouth Regional High School to vote on the rights-based ordinance. Tentative work session, Monday, January 29th, 2018 at 5 p.m. All the above meetings will be held in the town hall unless otherwise posted. Citizens wishing to be listed on the select board's agenda should notify the town hall before 12 p.m. the Friday before the scheduled meeting. New members are needed to fill the zoning board. If interested, please submit a letter of intent to the Plymouth Select Board, Office 6 Post Office Square, Plymouth, New Hampshire, 03264. Uh, here comes Joe. <coughs> At the next item, are you ready, Joe? Yes. All righty. You want to come on up? Okay. The first item, we have a purchase order. Or... Uh, ultra low sulfur clear diesel up to thirty thousand dollars yeah so what it is is I just have a budget in, for fuel in this time of year I get uh, so many deliveries at once that I have to just keep piling up purchase orders so <clears throat> So I'm just looking for a blanket so I don't have to do that. Yeah. The money's <coughs> there. So this would be good for like an uh, annual thing or? Is, right. Yeah, yeah okay. Do you, does this go out to bed? Um, no, we, we have an account with, with Dead River and they do like a state bit, state specs. And That's who the town uses. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? We have a motion. <coughs> I move that we approve this purchase order for thirty thousand dollars blanket purchase order for the highway department. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All righty. And you have another item? Yeah, so we have a snow policy, and, and so we're trying to enforce it. So I'm putting it together so you, so you can sign it. Well, I don't know if you have it in front of you, but um, the problem that we have is the old one, there's no, there's no consequences. So, you can tell them not to do it, and, and then if there's no consequences, it doesn't matter. So I've added at the bottom, you know, 
the, the penalties at the bottom is what I've added. So for your support to put, put it in place so <coughs> I can start. We have s s such a pile of people who just push this snow out in the road. And so I'm going to start on a small scale and start with the small ones and work my way up. But uh, I'm not going to make a lot of people happy. But it's just getting out of hand. It creates, especially for like on Main Street when we clean up, all these businesses push all the snow out into our piles. So when we go to pick up snow, we have a considerable amount more snow. And so we hire the trucks out and it takes us longer. So it's all coming out of our, our budget to pick up their snow. So where would they push the snow if, uh Oh, how would they deal with the snow, like in front of like a, a Main Street business? Right. Like everybody else, you own a business, see if, if you pile it up and pick it up if you have to. Do what the town does. If it's your snow, hire somebody to do it. Uh, and, and I'm not opposed to, to you know, if, if you have to, if you have to work with us and and push it out for for a short spell to get it picked up but it shouldn't become our responsibility i mean we'll work with them you know within reason but there there are a lot of people who plow driveways that just push it right out in the road and, and well what about the down i mean the downtown merchants uh they've got snow uh, where do they put that when they shovel it off the road well like on main street it's not on Main Street itself, it's not, you know, we pick up the sidewalk, so all that snow is, is done with us. But you take, like, Subway or, or any of those other businesses, their parking lots, I mean, they, they can push it into their own corner and pick it up, but they don't. It all ends up out in the road. They all used to get picked up, like Nappas and Subway. And right. They all used to what? Get picked up. Get picked up. They're pay for their <clears throat> private storm removal. Yeah. Well, there are people with loaders and bobcats, and you know that can go around and they're scoop there. it up and move it around. <clears throat> it doesn't have to go in the street. There are businesses that do pick it up. You know, like like Rite Aid, they they take care of their own snow, and you know the the printing place, they take care of their own snow and. So true colors you may be talking about like um well they're or, uh, they're tied in with with subway subway but there's a contractor there that does that whole area and if if we're out on main street he's not so apt to push it out but if we're not around all that snow ends up out there when we're not looking mm. So, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Bill. No, I'm just wondering about like en enforcement and also, you know, are you going to be, you know, just giving people? Yeah. So it's up to, you know, that's why if we put it in in order, it'll be like a ticket. I'll we'll call the PD. They go down. They'll give them a ticket. And first time around. Second time, it's more. And you know, we, we just if you don't if you don't make it. They don't have to pay a fine, and there's no point in having the policy because they're going to just keep doing it. So, and if there's some hardships, and, and, and you know, it's going to depend on the people. We're not out to 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 make people's lives, you know, put them out of business. We just it's just that everybody's doing it, and <clears throat> costs us a lot of money. Joe, isn't there a state law against pushing snow across a state highway? Uh, there is a state Main Street's law, a so. state highway. Correct. But, you know, we have a lot of side streets that do the same thing. So it's not just in town. It's, it's the whole town that we're oh, dealing with. I have another question. What about <clears throat> somebody who pushes snow across the road? Is that something you have discretion? Well, when you push it across a road and you it lands in a ditch, after a while, we, when we come along, you the road goes like this, and then the so wing can't move right. it. Right. So, my opinion. So that is would no. be part of your discretion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I have to say that I, I'm uh, not guilty of that, but I'm a recipient of uh, a neighbor that pushes snow across the street and ends up in a large pile that I had to install a mirror on a tree just so that I could see around. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's not a problem until it becomes a problem, but there are certain people who, who abuse it, you know, and... Right. They are given a warning first, by the way. It's not first right. time you're going to get hit with the... Yeah, the first time we're going to ask you nicely and, and then hand you this, this policy that's signed and say, hey, this is how it works. It used to be if people got yelled at by the road agent, <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to work anymore. More. Yeah, we don't yell. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about how it used to be. <laughs> any, any more discussion or? Okay, do we have a motion? I move that we adopt this proposed ordinance for snow obstruction policy. We have a second. I'll second it. Can we? Can I, uh, I amend it, or can I uh, suggest an amendment? Because there is there is no uh, language that says first offense might you know might be a warning. It goes right to a hundred bucks for first offense and five hundred bucks for a second offense. So it says subject to a penalty in the amount of. So so what what I would do is my the first time I would I would come to them nicely and say hey uh, we have a policy and I'd appreciate it if you didn't do this and then I would hand them this copy and say this is our ordinance so consider this your warning I, I saw the police chief back there um, trying to get some attention uh, Steve I have a question Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I heard a call too I heard somebody say the word policy and then say the word ordinance those are two very distinct things if this is a town policy I will not be able to do any enforcement on it if it's an ordinance I will However, my question to the board would be, I thought in order to create a new ordinance, we would have to have that at a town meeting rather than just at a regular select board meeting because we have to get public input for that. And Steve's correct. This could only be a policy. So on this, it does say ordinance, provision of this Let's ordinance. Let's say policy regulating snow policy. obstructing and removal. No, that just happened to end up in when Neil made the motion. It, it can only be a policy, and this is written as a policy. Yep. Okay, it's got um, this first paragraph says uh, Town of Plymouth, New Hampshire uh, ordinance regulating s snow removal. So, um, should we just change that word to policy? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. I've got it on this one here. But okay. Pass this one around and sign. I have a question for Chief Absolutely. It's probably the same thing we're going to ask. Right? So, you just said if it's a policy, you cannot enforce it. Correct, because it's just a town policy. I, there would be, I would not be able to go give somebody a summons and order them to uh, pay a fine. Uh, when it's an ordinance, now it, it, that uh, would invoke the legal process where they have an opportunity to be able to contest it before a judge. With a policy, there's none of that. This becomes a civil matter, and the police departments don't deal with civil matters. We're strictly criminal. Right, but as a policy, the highway superintendent can bring that person before the board of selectmen. Correct. That's it called, and then you would police the issue. Okay. But just so you know, I, if if it's a policy, I won't be able to enforce it. This is not coming. This won't be coming from the police department. But. So thank you, Steve. You're welcome. But then uh, that gets to the penalties section, um, so that um, any infraction or any person guilty of an infraction or suspected of guilt for an infraction shall be brought before the board of select. However, this. I just had Joe draft something that I felt would help him because it's getting worse by the month, yeah. not by the year. Well, yeah. We can hear them. So if they, if Joe gives a warning and then it happens a second time, then there's a thing coming for us. That sounds so, good. So that my, would be good if we can change the language I'd like to for modify that. my motion <clears throat> to strike the word ordinance and replace it with policy wherever it appears. So. So my only problem with you putting it in policy now, I, I can't call the PD and say, hey, give them a ticket. No, correct. All right. they have to, that's your prerogative. But if you want it to be this winter, <clears throat> we don't, we, it has to go before the yeah. legislative body. It has to go through Brian, new ordinance, new town ordinance. Okay. 
So we can keep it like this and then maybe draft up an ordinance for next for next season. Yep. Okay. I'm okay with that. I wanna re Frank, did you have <coughs> I have a question because uh, um, I I do a lot of shoveling on the sidewalks and I obviously shovel into the gutter and or Chase Street uh, because we don't have the means to I don't know where I go with my shovel full of snow. <laughs> so um, I'm just curious and concerned about the way the policy is written as far as I can honestly see what you're talking about, someone using a plow, but some of these businesses are brick to brick. We don't have We handle all sidewalk snow. Okay. So Chase Street's kind of uh, an exception because because it, it's a street and it's fully to the width so we, we can only get within a, a foot or so of the building correct so it's to our advantage if you push it out that's, and that's we, what we're we can that's what we've been doing and I didn't want to get uh, so um, element of under the policy of pushing snow into a town road or a street so it's, it's basically anybody that would have parking spots. Right. Talking about driveways versus Chase Street is actually a, a street. So can we can we just have the word ordinance replaced by policy and yep. put this in the s signature file? I modified my motion. Yeah. All right. Hey, we have a second. But, <clears throat> and we, they had a second. I had seconded. But, okay. But, um, with, uh, as far as like the penalty, though, are you going to le leave it as written, or are we just going to go back to? Is this the way that it currently states, or you you added that penalty section? No, this is this is new. The penalty part's new. Yeah, I think we I think we might have to uh, strike that. Um, why would I? Well, then how's it going to work? How am I going to enforce it if I don't? That's my whole point of being here. So, so what are you saying under penalties? Say the so first no offense would be a warning, and the second offense would it'd be required to come before the board. You know, I don't see if we can. You know, if you throw a, a fine at them um, with no ordinance to back it up. Well, with the policy, I mean, it's a town right. policy. So, so, that. so basically, uh, I got to rewrite is, it. Is there a, can we have a ruling on that? Or, I mean, <coughs> Steve, do you have anything to? I don't, because, like I said, the enforcement of a town policy is not law enforcement. I can try and do some research for you to find an answer. Um, but aside from that, I don't have an answer tonight for you. I mean, we've done, we do fines like we did with the... Um, with the airport. Mm -hmm. Well, with uh, selling things, um, yeah. the little carts, the food carts. Yeah. So we've got the ability, obviously, to do fines. And yeah. Just a matter a, of... There's an ordinance for uh, carts, though, I think. Is there? So, yeah. It's not a policy, it's an ordinance. Oh. What about that, the doesn't airport? Doesn't that fall under the, the peddler's license? Yeah. The airport was just something spectacular. <laughs> so, so at this point, just the first time it's a warning. Next time I send them to the selectmen. Well, that's that's then, that's then my then, uh, um, uh, least suggestion of an amendment. Uh, and then I'll, I'll have to just work on getting getting an ordin ordinance for yeah. next season. What would Brian about getting an ordinance? Okay. It'd be a, so be a I'll table my motion. Well, I think, I think table or just a minute. No, you don't. Okay. Still want to go forward with um, making the. So, so uh, we are going to change the wording where it is ordinance to policy, and under penalties, we're going to first put first offense will be a warning. Uh, so how do they get in touch with you? How do I? How do I? Push him to you. I'm gonna be here you'll, in the morning too. Yeah, I mean you'll if you you've got my my cell phone, <laughs> and you just go. I don't want to uh, knocking on your door. I just want to know how how. No, you're gonna you're gonna town. let us know, and we'll we'll do the contact. Yeah, we'll put them on the agenda and. Uh, okay. Piece of cake, but it's no, we, we've honestly it's for the public that's listening. We've had way too many close calls because of anger this year. No right. To be in tow, we're going to have a gun put in our face. Yeah. You know, we, we can't tolerate this anymore, but I can't have Joe arguing back either. But we should also so. possibly put this in and make it a, 
a warrant article to get an ordinance? I mean, there there is an ordinance about put putting snow in our streets. So I mean, is there? But it but it doesn't include the fine part. So that that's what I'm trying to do. So so what I'll do is just we'll have to have a go with well, the. Well, then I if there's an actual ordinance, and we'll we'll look through. Then we'll just, isn't there? And I'll get together with the chief and. The, isn't there like a baseline amount for like shirking a, an ordinance? You know, like uh, if you if you shirk an ordinance or, or don't abide by it, we'll, we can fine you like a. I I don't have any of that in front of me. To or is it you can fine up to a thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. If there's if there's a snow removal ordinance, I think we're all set. So are we are we gonna move the question. Okay. So the question would be modified with changing. Pol uh, ordinance to policy striking the fine and the second offense at this point would be that the select board would ask them to now I'm gonna have to suggest that you table it for tonight yeah because okay. if there's an ordinance okay. in place I would draw my allows motion. Steve okay table show to work with Steve right. then it's up to the board to start enforcing it okay and you might not need this policy uh, because you can issue up to a thousand dollar Fine for continuing to uh, disobey an ordinance. Yep. So, and well, I fully support Joe pursuing that. We'll, we'll <laughs> so. just keep at it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. All right, you, Joe. <clears throat> Steve Rand, Suzanne Smith. Okay. Good evening, and thanks for inviting us. Um, as you know, this is the second year of the session, the legislative session. And so rather than starting off slowly, it really starts off with a bang. We've had two sessions so far voting on bills that were held over from last year, and then Committees have been meeting four or five days a week to uh, have public hearings on bills from every point of vantage point you can imagine. So, oh, can't um, have that one. Yes, you can. Sorry. <laughs> so, I didn't know if there was anything special you wanted from us or if you'd like us to give you a rundown of some of the things we think are important. I had on here they were going to discuss HB 1470, a bill to repeal timber tax. Yes, that we had a that's in my committee, and we had a public hearing on it last week, and all the and we also had a second bill which would amend the timber tax, and the uh, the stakeholders are meeting. I think they met this afternoon for a subcommittee. Uh, so we had someone from Municipal Association, DRA, Department of Revenue Administration, one of our committee members, uh, Forest Society, TOA, Timberland Owners. So they all met this afternoon to try to come up with some kind of compromise on the bill that would alter the timber tax. The bill, that bill as it was introduced, would lower the turnaround time uh, when an intent to cut is filed. When a town receives the intent to cut, they would have five days to get it back out and be done with it and approve it, or not approve it, but sign off on it. And that means uh, Conservation Commission, Select Board in five days. So uh, a lot of people objected to that as it being too short of a time. Cities big that have a lot of large towns where the select board meets every week they were like this is plenty of time and towns like Plymouth and Hebron and Holderness where we meet every couple of weeks it's kind of difficult um, <clears throat> so I think they're going to come up with a compromise maybe 15 days on mm -hmm. that and that was the gist of that bill the repeal the timber tax although a lot of people testified uh, such as TOA um, that they really don't like the timber tax they realized that getting rid of it completely would be devastating for the state not only devastating to the municipalities who would be losing that income but also what we learned was that the timber tax was instituted to protect to conserve forests 
because people would find out their property taxes were going up because of their timber and they say well, I'll just clear cut it all and then I won't have to pay the high taxes so this kind of was a pay as you sell the timber mm -hmm. thing so that bill will most likely die and or or it will be turned into a commission to study how to fix the timber tax or you know make a better system something that can be approved yeah something that everybody would approve and that might unless the subcommittee comes up with some great ideas in the one day they have to meet the problem is is that because it's a money bill it has to be out of our committee by January 30th so that doesn't give us much time considering <coughs> we're hearing having public hearings on four to six bills every week and then subcommittees on many of them and then it has to go to finance or ways and means if it passes so 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 there's nothing left to the bill that's going to take revenue away from the towns I believe that no one on the bill will, on the committee will vote to pass the bill that will do away with the timber tax completely mm. which would mean municip municipalities are shut out so I believe that bill will either be dead or turned into commission to study how we can better deal with the challenges mm -hmm. that I hope so. TOA brought up and a couple of foresters brought up. We can't up. survive these continuing cuts of revenue. Right. Oh, I agree. Totally. That's yeah. We know, are all very aware of that. Yeah, I mean the municipal association when they <coughs> put out their thing said, you know, we think this will be dead in the water and that was kind of the opinion of even the the foresters who said we don't like paying you know we don't like the timber tax it's complicated but maybe we can figure out something else and nothing to do with how it affects municipalities but how it would make life easier for foresters mm -hmm. but definitely I don't want to I would vote against anything that took it away from the municipalities because mm -hmm. that's you know there's so few <coughs> things municipalities get right now almost nothing yeah I know I know <laughs> yeah, I hate restoring our shared revenue would be a good first step yes and <coughs> we tried to do that uh, last week I believe or two weeks ago and well uh, retirement system well. was an attempt uh, we, we we tried to get 15% uh, of the yeah. retirement system contribution right. back which is a lot smaller than it originally was I think it was like 40 percent. it was 30 it fails and <clears throat> and everything fails uh, to pass the fiscal test because the state has no money but still on the other hand the state would manage to give back a hundred hundred million dollars to uh, to businesses uh, for um, uh, for tax relief uh, against business profits tax, which to me is just, uh, an, pardon the term, well, I won't use that term. <laughs> <laughs> You're being recorded. It's, yes, it's, it's, a not, it's not good. You notice that I have uh, on my little sheet here on the first part, I have good, okay, and bad. <laughs> It falls in the bad category, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's it's it's, it's silly, and and it, it makes no sense to me that we would, uh, because we have so little revenue, and we without the broad without a broad based tax, and it all falls so unevenly on the towns, which is always the push down. And and I'm in the municipal county municipal government uh, committee, and we we hear a lot of bills that are. <coughs> They're pretty picky -yoon. Occasionally, we have one that's interesting, um, and, uh, and but all, all, without exception, there is. Well, of course, there is a state law that that requires that any bill that carries a financial burden to the town cannot be passed without uh, without being funded by the state. But there are tricky ways around that, and uh, and and we. We've managed to do that at the state, so leaving leaving the towns high and dry. <coughs> Don't ask me to name those tricky ways, because then I'd be probably accused of being complicit. <laughs> um, however, you know, so uh, some of these things on my little sheet. Oh, so by the way, first, so uh, so I'm Steve Rand. I'm your state representative. Nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet. see you guys, uh, gentlemen and. 
Josie. How long have you lived in town? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wanted to, um, so I wanted to thank you for the job you do here. Uh, anybody who's in public service gets it. We know what the hours are, what the demands are, what sometimes the unreasonable demands are. Uh, Suzanne and I are like in a similar situation and we, um, we definitely do get it. And uh, so I wanted to thank you for your service to this town. It's indispensable and, uh, and I personally appreciate it. Um, and uh, I think uh, as, I, as I see it, uh, town boards and committees up to it, including select boards, are the, are, the, are the proving ground for folks who would aspire to a higher office and state office. And I think it's very important that we keep that in mind because we do definitely need good people <coughs> in our state government. In, in the reps positions. There are three of us, uh, Tra Travis and Suzanne and I represent three towns, but not each. You, un you understand how that works. Um, and and uh, it's important that we have those folks there. So keep your ears and your eyes open for good folks uh, to run, because we don't really want to have no choice. And also r to run, because your, your term is ending, right, John? Mm -hmm. So, and also to run for the select board. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's our democratic privilege to do that. Uh, so there are a couple of house actions already this year that's on that, bu that little bunch there. You know, I think one of the most um, interesting ones is the, well, I don't know if it's interesting, but, excuse me. Um, is the um, the residency the residency change where uh, basically if this continues and goes through and the governor signs it, um, uh, our our college students will be dis disenfranchised uh, unless they have known cars that are registered in the state of New Hampshire and have a state New Hampshire license. So um, I am sure that this will be challenged constitutionally. There have been other bills that have come through. It's HB 372. Um, it's a direct aim. Even the sponsors say that it's a direct aim at students. I don't agree with that, but uh, that's, that's where we are. Um, we did have, uh, we did say the, the, the Reggie program, the um, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, so that there will continue to be money coming from uh, carbon allowances to uh, to mm -hmm. municipal and school districts for energy conservation and efficiency projects. I think that's something that you could take a look at because there's a, it's gone from two to five million dollars annually. So I think that's maybe it's annually or is it biannual? Well, it still has to pass the finance committee right. and then have to go to the Senate too. So right, but think about that because, uh, you know, nothing better. We've legalized the uh, possession of marijuana, um, which uh, the I Senate think will is kill. Will, will may be killed, but the House legalized it. Um, we have... Uh, did, did you mean medical marijuana or no, recreational. recreational marijuana? Well, actually, right. it's more... It's possession? It would provide, yeah, you could possess under an ounce and quarters, you could three grow quarters. three quarters of an ounce. Three quarters of an ounce, and yeah. you could grow your own. But like you couldn't sell you can, it or buy it. You can <coughs> have two or three plants, and you can you can't yeah, you can't buy it or sell it. But you can have it. So like it's a little kind of interesting uh, because um, <laughs> I guess if somebody gives it to you, you're you're okay. Uh, um, I think I think we're on we're, we're probably on the on the road towards legalized m legalized marijuana which it is not now but that's going to take some that's going to take another iteration so this one would if it if it uh goes <coughs> if the senate agrees it, and there seems to be some interest in doing this is going to legalize the possession of that um we have um upcoming can, you, can i say yeah, something yeah. about the marijuana thing yeah. um 
have there been any issues with the medical marijuana with having the dispensary in town? I know that you know there was a huge. Um, no, there hasn't really been any issues. I didn't. I mean, I hadn't heard anything, but I just wanted. It to would be interesting if you had a chance to have the. The, the purveyor there come to talk to the board. Uh, it came to Rotary, and it was very, very interesting to see, like, what is every, we all think about the psychoactive part of marijuana, of, mar of marijuana, but the medical part is really, really potent and uh, and doesn't involve people getting looped, and it really has many, many medical benefits. So. Uh, it's something I wasn't aware of, but uh, you know I wasn't really up to speed on, and I don't imagine most people are. Uh, so um, you will have uh, an opportunity to increase your local transportation improvement fee from five to ten dollars. So that's money that you could, uh, but you need to enact that. That's a that's a um, that is a. Uh, uh, requires a local, a local, um, local action uh, to enact that that new potential to double your fee. Uh, uh, then we are seeing a bill to lower interest rate on delinquent taxes. Um, most every tax collector is against this idea. Oh yeah. Right now we have uh, we have 12 percent on delinquent taxes before the lien and 18 percent after. Which it is admittedly high, but I think it is uh, <coughs> evidently it brings great results too. When, uh, when that's yeah. Right. Is that this a, is a perennial is a bill that comes up every few years to lower uh, the interest on the property taxes if they're not paid on time. So and if, if municipalities right. would lose like thirteen million dollars annually if it was lowered down to. Right. So that's probably one of those situations where you know if that bill bill was to pass, would the t would the legislature bring up the, bring the money and, and provide it under the uh, uh, because no. basically no of course not so that's kind of like how the state does it to to uh, the, the towns and and uh, they they take away revenue and they add expense so it's it's a good example uh, and then. Um, there's a bill. There's a bill in my committee to uh, a very complicated bill that uh, is a procedure to recall a selectman. So um, what? Be <laughs> be advised. <laughs> be advised. <laughs> <laughs> now, a and and you got to think that every time we see a bill, what we're seeing is somebody's experience with the situation mm -hmm. that caused them to want to re uh, to recall a selectman. Right, because it wouldn't come up. I mean, who's going to think of this until some some of that that situation mm -hmm. happens? So somebody has a lot of energy to create a bill to come up with a way to get rid of a selectman without going to court. <laughs> and that's what this bill wants to do. I, it's not going to make it probably, but it just sort of an il illustrates the kind of stuff. Well, it's in my committee, so that's something that I'm going to deal with, uh, and. Uh, there are lots of uh, interesting bills. Uh, uh, one of the more interesting one actually is uh, HB seventeen forty nine, which is the, which is <coughs> putting putting a fine on municipalities and <coughs> officials who <coughs> dare to create any ordinances that would <coughs> regulate firearms. the use of firearms. As well, I don't think there's any di dispute about the carrying of firearms certainly not after our constitutional carry but now the now the the firearms folks are uh, compressing their point and they have discovered there are a couple of towns in New Hampshire who have uh, put some limitations on the people's ability to fire their weapons on town property and um, so it's a clash between your 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 statutory responsibility to uh, to protect the, and look out for the safety and welfare of of the uh, of the citizens of your of your of your town and the rights of the you know, of the gun owners who 
think that somehow they should there should be no no limitations on any use of the gun yes, sir. we've had issues of uh, people with firearms at the airport mm -hmm. and uh, that that's you know the town is trying to control that right. and the town can legally control that because well, it's town so, property. So that wouldn't be affected by this legislation. So actually, I don't think that as, a, as the bill is anywhere. written, the town does not have. If the, the bill passes, you mean? No, right now the town does not have the right to have an ordinance to control the use of firearms on town property. <clears throat> well, that sounds like a, an issue that. Uh, uh, there's, uh, yes, it's an issue. You know, look at the RSA 15926, basically. So, uh, but but the, the current ordinance doesn't have any fines associated. There's no penalty for the town to actually put an ordinance into effect or a regulation. So, so um, so the the gun the gun rights folks say, well. This ordinance might as well not be there because there's no penalty. So we have to have a penalty. So that's what the bill does. The bill is, adds a penalty <coughs> to, uh, so that both the, the municipality and the officials involved in a, creating an ordinance will be fined for creating an ordinance. So uh, uh, it's I'm here. We're hearing it in my committee. Um, um, I guess is that it will not come out about to pass, but you know, I've got a thousand emails. That's so. the thing about the, uh, <laughs> the bill. Oh, okay. In the municipal association. Okay. Do you so. want this back? No, I have it on my okay. computer at home. But, um, right. A couple. There's a couple more bills that have to that would could hurt municipalities. Uh, one is in Ways and Means, and it's about. Um, it would allow meals and rooms tax to be distributed mm. a portion of it uh, would be based on the percentage of what your town collected so rather than it being divided just as a percentage across the state a town for instance like Hebron who has one store and no restaurants would not get as much as Plymouth that has a lot of restaurants and and uh, has a lot of taxable meals and rooms so, but uh, so I'm not sh quite sure what's going to happen with that. It was in uh, Ways and Means, and they had their public hearing, and they haven't voted on it yet. So, okay. and the school voucher bill okay. passed the House, and now we'll go to the Senate. No, actually, it was the Senate, was the Senate bill. bill. It'll have to go through a committee of conference, and the I don't want to say the danger or the risk, but it's more the risk is that this SAU could lose a fair amount of money if the money follows the child, not the school. So if someone chose to homeschool their child, that they could get $3,000 a year or $3,500 a year out of the SAU budget um, for that. An amendment was put on which passed the House uh, two weeks ago that limits it to there were certain qualifiers and it's pretty complicated and I don't know the whole thing but but that's something to watch out for there the ACLU I think is planning on uh, filing suit unconstitutional or something okay but so there are there are income uh, to, to get the money there you have to be now you have to be you have to come from school from public school you have to the child has to come be in a public school before he transfers to a different school then that child has to come from a, a school that's underperforming according to the state so it's the state formula well it's according and to the parents I think is who makes the decision well, I don't know I know I thought it was actually some I know it's underperforming I don't know exactly how you determine <coughs> and, uh, and then there are income there are income limitations yeah, as well. Yeah, that's all part of the amendment that passed. So, you know, okay, so, but still, I think the principle is that, you know, because it basically allows the, the parent to send their child to any school. Uh, it could be a uh, sectarian, could be a- uh, Religious a, a, school. A madras. It could, yeah. be a, uh, it could be a Christian school. It could be um, any school. Uh, 
could be far away, could be close by. Um, and uh, the money, that money that uh, would come to the school district would no longer come to the school district. You know. uh, is that a net positive or a negative? I think most of the costs of the school are fixed. So I think it's a negative for the school. Okay. Originally, the bill also counted for homeschool kids, and they so the amendment did take that out. Let me interrupt the uh, discussion on the school thing, but I have a specific bill that I have want to ask you guys. In fact, it's probably it will be in your committee, probably. <laughs> it's the um, <clears throat> in fact, I don't, it's Senate Bill either 529 or 592, whatever. It's to allow the town of Warren to dredge the Baker River once every two years. You know, I just saw that for the first time this afternoon, and I just saw the title of it. And since it was in the Senate, I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to it. But I've heard the, I think it's a terrible idea. I would hope the sponsor, like, um, pulls it. Because the spot, apparently one of the sponsors is Senator Gaida. I think he's and, the prime sponsor. And what happened during old. the flood in November, October, yeah. was they dredged it in a fairly improper manner. Right. Straight banks down to the bedrock. And it was just a chute of right. water going through and all the... And yeah, stuff that um, was is, is going downstream when yeah. Plymouth is downstream um, yeah. so um, in fact it, it ended up killing the aquifer that 10 wells uh, dried up and uh, Senator guy to you know created a GoFundMe page to raise forty thousand dollars to you know build um, you know wells for these houses so I'm thinking <clears throat> if that happens with an unregulated you know dredging of the river yeah. did they have a wetlands permit to do that they got uh, DES approved it according it, it, to they didn't even have to um, um, do any kind of like you know oversight or they just went ahead and uh, like an emergency permit you can yeah. go ahead yeah it was after the you know the house got washed down the river yep. so I mean I would hope that that bill gets ITL so quickly but the hearing, I think, is the 30th in State House 103 or something like that, which I think I'm going to go to. So that's one of the. Yeah, that's, it would be That is one of the um, one of the tricks of being a being a representative is that all the stuff that you really want to go to hearings and stuff you right. can't do because you're in your own committee. Which it <coughs> well, if it became a senator, then you have multiple yes, committees right, that you yeah, can go to. Yeah. That <laughs> that's why every that just you makes have. it worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you're a sponsor, you can go to it. We have, uh, yes. Well, well, I have a bill I'm sponsoring. Yeah, but you, that doesn't mean that you're not you're not missing your. Uh, so. uh, miss, it doesn't mean that you're not missing your own committee to work. So, right, right, yeah. They're not going to reschedule for you. I don't think. So it's the beginning of the session. If other bills come up like that one, I'd like to talk more with you. So, and will you be sending a letter on that one? Uh, yeah. Or showing up? Well, I'm also a chair of like um, the River Local Advisory Committee. Oh, good. So a letter be coming from the committee, right? Or from from that. Right. Yeah. I I have have uh, a question mm. for you. Uh, regarding that timber tax mm -hmm. proposal, um, it, it it it's become known that municipalities are losing revenue because there Cheating. is a preponderance of large-scale timber harvesters who are chipping uh, wood that has a higher utility value. Mm -hmm. And uh, to them, it's economically feasible to take uh, saw logs and put them through a chipper. Mm -hmm. And it shortchanges the landowner on their stumpage fees, and it shortchanges the community on their ta tax because the higher value timber is taxed at a higher rate. And if you put it through the chipper, it's low grade chips, right. and it's a, a very small fraction. And, and that's what's happening on now, a large scale. But the forester is who puts the plan in place. I know. So you have to make it's sure you got. Worms. Yeah, I mean. But I wanted to know if that has been brought up. No, that well, there has been brought up that there is cheating going on, but that particular thing was not brought up in the public hearing. Well, I I know that a lot of saw happening. logs are going through a lot of chippers, and, yeah. and that way the timber taxes are going down. The towns are getting less money. So when 
I'm on I'm co-chair of Conservation Commission in Hebron when we get an intent to cut and we review it we look at it and we look at who the forester is and if it's a forester who we know has a not great reputation we question more thoroughly the intent to cut and Hebron actually refused to the select board refused to sign off on an intent to cut last year we got in a lot of trouble with a lot of people but because they knew that that forester was not up to snuff for you know what doing a good job yeah, there are tricks property so but you really the town has to be diligent when you look at the intent to cut going wait a minute they've got all this ash they're going to chip you know or whatever that is but well, you but i'll bring it up when understand. we have our discussion yeah. Yeah. yeah i just wanted to bring that point up yeah no that's a that's a that's a good one that's a good point mm -hmm. I'll, we'll be discussing it uh well as far as the chipping i remember it was probably eight to ten years ago someone from national came to new hampshire saw our chipping program loved it and then said we need to get the whole country chipping more and so they gave an incentive to chip so at that point uh, there was only a few states set up to chip so new hampshire just went whole hog into chipping in every single log well not every but a far more majority than was was being chipped good saw logs because they were getting more of an incentive because there was government money coming into them to do it. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that program ended and went away. I'm not sure, but no other states picked it up because they weren't set up for it. Yeah. Someone really missed the mark on what they were trying to do. They didn't use common sense at that time. So well, Bottoms dropped out of the chip market at this point because of the bio, biomass is overloaded, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other things. We went to hear uh, a talk by the um, advertising agency for the tourism for the state. Mm -hmm. And a point was brought up that the marketing was great, the whole plan, but they were using out of state uh, marketing firm to do New Hampshire's promotions. Mm -hmm. And they thought, well, isn't there a firm in New Hampshire that could do their marketing, keep the money in state? I'm sure you hear that a lot with everything, construction, everything, but. Yeah. I was just at a meeting at, I'm on the State Park Advisory Council, and they've just hired a new marketing director who's going to be living in, you know, working in New Hampshire and, um, you know, who, who does work and she'll be employed by the state. So, but I don't know about the marketing firms, although there's, I mean, White Market Attractions is in the state and they do a lot of promotional stuff and... Mm. Um, I know their answer that. was, well, we won some awards because we picked this firm out of New York. Mm -hmm. So, I uh, Second thing, the, the town is looking at a rights-based ordinance, which is uh, a community organizing group mm -hmm. from more of a national political, maybe cousin to a political organization. We're not sure. I don't know where exactly all the funding comes from. And I didn't know there is a something in the state now, American Legislative Exchange Council, mm -hmm. which is funded in part by the Koch Lobbyists, brothers, brothers. Lobby, uh, big oil companies that are coming into the state and basically doing a lot of the same things that, the, that this rights space ordinance would do, where they would write, uh, legis uh, write laws, write ordinances mm -hmm. for, the um, for the states kind of like what this community rights organization would do for the town of Plymouth. So I kind of want to get they're, your take. They're very separate. Yeah, ALEC that, is national ALEC is, <laughs> and they um, have a political agenda. Are you okay with what they're doing? I ALEC? Don't I don't know what ALEC is doing. I can't imagine that it's... You mean am I okay with what ALEC does? A-L-E-C, no. which is, a, which is very not. similar it seems ALEC's to what... A, yeah, that, it's, it's, a, it's an extreme right wing think tank and funding mechanism for um, what I don't like about it is that I go to a lot of legislative seminars conventions whatever you want to call them they're educational things and they're all nonpartisan they have Republicans they have Democrats people sit around and find common ground to do things and they do not write and we pay to go to these. And the, they do not 
provide us with legislation and say, here, do this legislation. Um, Alec, my understanding is, is that legislators do not pay to go and that lobbyists and big companies pay for, they're sponsored by larger companies, think tanks, whatever, and they do give model legislation. And there's been legislation in the New Hampshire House to have someone say if their legislation was written by a group, they're supposed to say it. Of course, it didn't go anywhere. But, you know, it's one of the many organizations that legislators use to get their education from. It's just not one I choose to go with. I'm more with Council for State Governments, uh, National Council of State Legislators, National Environmental Caucus, which are all pretty much bipartisan and you find a pretty good mix of people from all walks of life. I just came back from the State Agriculture and Rural Leaders Conference, which was in Kansas City this year, and I'm like this little Democrat and this minority of large cattle farmers and beef producers and you know, but I learned so much from, from just learning what's going on all over the country. So it's, you know, I don't mind doing it, being there. One other thing. Um, you mentioned the voting. And um, I kind of, I don't know if you've thought about it this way, but with the college and the new, okay. New Hampshire's kind of a very unique state. In many ways. Where this island in the middle, where you've got Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maine, Vermont, pretty much all have their predetermined who they're voting for, especially when it comes to the president. And a lot of, and then you have New Hampshire in the middle, which is very much a swing state. So a vote in New Hampshire from someone from one of these states that ascend and send to Plymouth State or Keene State or UNH, sometimes that vote and people may argue this could be what's happening. That vote in New Hampshire might be worth 500 votes to be taken away from another state. So there's quite an incentive to take these kids that are coming from these states around the peripheral of New Hampshire and really work them to get that vote in New Hampshire. And it's I just don't know if anybody's looked at it that way, being that it's a swing state and that we, we sit there and we watch the voting. And a lot of times, I don't even know, I've never met Travis. I'm sure he's a very nice young man. I'm assuming he goes to Plymouth State or did or... He did. Yeah. He lives here now. I, he, I don't know. I've never met him. And again, I'm sure he's... Yeah. But it's, it's, um, it's interesting to when you work the polls and you see the people mm -hmm. bust in or vanned with vans, I don't know, multiple vans bringing the kids in. And it does have a way of diluting the residents that have called Plymouth their home for more than four years, diluting their vote and almost kind of canceling it out in some cases. So I understand why that legislation is being brought forward. And I also look at it that it's, there, there was an instant not that long ago, I think three years ago, where there's an ordinance that was being voted on by the town of Plymouth. And the college kids showed up in droves to vote against it. And it kind of, I think, opened up some eyes that the college really does impact. It ended up being a tied vote. And the ordinance didn't pass. That would have helped a lot of families that were living in town to get more information it's, uh, about who was living in college or student housing. So. I think their, their eyes opened up that, it, yes, it does influence our vote and what the townspeople would like, but I think maybe there might have been uh, pressure from somewhere else to not make a big deal about it and just be quiet because overall, it's a good thing that the college kids vote. So there are so. many people in Plymouth that would, that there is an avenue for these kids from the peripheral, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, to vote during the presidential elections. It's not like they're being told they can't vote. There's always that option of a absentee ballot to vote in their hometown. So I just want to point that out to you. Oh, we're well aware. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of and, you know, the, the, as, as Sean Jasper, our former speaker, said a few years ago when one of these bills was coming up, he said, 
you know, I went to college and I think he might have gone to Plymouth. He went somewhere, somewhere else in New Hampshire from where he grew up. And he said, you know, I spent a lot more time there than I did in the town I grew up in because I was there nine months of the year. I knew more what was going on in the town I went to college in. And so he was, you know, at that point his stance was that college students should be able to vote wherever they lived as long as they only voted once you know and so and a lot of the kids at Plymouth State do live in New Hampshire like Travis grew up in Nashua so he's not coming from another state um, or he was not coming from another state now he's lived here for five years but um, and we have business owners here who came to school and stayed and you know became integral parts of the community so it's really a it's a tough question there are a lot of and know, it's a challenge a all around looking at that yeah. I know I went one to one of them is constitutional because in part in fact our Constitution re re uh, re requires that you only need toward states that you need to be uh, domiciled which is a, it's different than resident you know domiciled was a very is a very temporary situation it's the last place you put your head and so all all the arguments around this subject usually have to do with what's the what's the definition of domicile. So this particular bill that we have here that uh, that just passed through the House and the Senate um, causes the the definition of the word domicile to mean that you have to have if you have a car if you have a car then you, you, you are not domiciled unless you have it registered and have a license in the state of New Hampshire within 60 days of having voted. That's how they're going to figure out whether you're domiciled or not. Which is, um, uh, well, you know, leaves out a whole bunch of people who don't have cars. I mean, it, it, I don't, can't imagine it's going to withstand the constitutional test. But One thing that's interesting, and, in, in, you know, I went to college and I voted my first time in uh, Wakefield, Rhode Island, the University of Rhode Island. And I, I went and I voted because I said, you got to vote. If they would have said, you know, here's a piece of paper you can send to your hometown, get your absentee ballot in time and vote. No, they wanted me to vote there. And I'm sure I did not vote for the person they wanted me to vote for. But I saw all these down ballots. I voted for Ronald Reagan in the second uh, time he ran. And, and I was very proud to do that. But I saw all these down the, down the paper races. Mm -hmm. And I had no clue. I didn't. I had no clue. So I looked at whoever, and I didn't vote straight ballot or anything. I just looked whose name looked more interesting that might ring a bell to me. And not one name <laughs> rang a bell to me. But I felt obligated to keep to keep checking off names. And I don't know. Maybe I was the one that uh, threw the ballot, the race th the other way. But when you look at it, there's only several towns in New Hampshire. There's there's Keene, there's Plymouth, there's Durham. There's like three or four towns that really get affected that there's some people in this community that probably may never ever be able to, with the way that it is, never be able to have your job. That is correct. So I really would correct. love you to to go there and say, you know, there there's some constituents that feel this way and you know, we want to make sure that Plymouth of the three or four towns really makes that um, vocal that there is another side to this story, especially the residents of those impacted towns. More than anywhere in the country, Plymouth, Keene, and Durham, no other, no other community affected the way the swing state of New Hampshire with those geographical states around us. Okay. I have a comment, if it's okay. When I went to school in Philadelphia, I. I always voted by absentee ballot. I never missed an election. But uh, I also had a special interest in Plymouth. And I came back here. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of uh, people I grew up with in Plymouth, uh, you know, they, they went away to school and they didn't come back. And I know there are a lot of students that come to Plymouth who are, uh, they really like it here. But uh, what, what we found is that we have to open the doors of opportunity for them in our community. And we've been working diligently with the university to find every 
avenue that we can think of to involve students in our community and, and get them in and, and some of the new uh, academic programs at the school are opening up ways for them to become uh, you have the interface you know mm -hmm. and, and get involved with the community and I, I know that there are a lot of students who, who would like to live here and and uh, if they live in a bubble, they don't really know what's going on in our town. And uh, if they vote in our town and they live in a bubble, then that could be a dangerous thing for the town. But uh, if we can get more and more students, if we can get a culture going to uh, have more and more student involvement in the community, I think it's a healthy thing. It is a really healthy thing because mm -hmm. then they care. You know, I mean, even when it comes to I the think we're on the, the right road. And the yeah. You know, and I mean, stuff. and of course, the, the well known fact is that New Hampshire is losing its young people uh, from this out of this state mm -hmm. in, in, in tremendous numbers. And we can't possibly, you know, it's a graying state, and the dem dem demographics yeah. are like, well, you know, look at this crowd, except for yeah, like, we're the well, median age. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> know, right, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, like, yeah. Look at it. Look at it. Hebrew, I'm young. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, it's um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that we have to figure out ways. Not it's not a way. You know, it's just no one way. You have to try to do all the different things that you can to try to s make sure that uh, we have as much open doors as possible. You know, job training, uh, having, you know putting some funding back into our educational institutions. I mean, all those things, but those are big issues that are not, not easily solved by this. Uh, so you mentioned education. So uh, UNH, um, um, yeah, PSU, Keene, if you qualify for a Pell Grant, you can get in free education? Yeah. How, where'd they find the money for that? I <laughs> I just heard it on the radio the other day. And I guess it's like for 12,000 kids, they're thinking, you yeah. know, it might. Yeah. Just your first year. Well, they did. Just what? Just your freshman year. Just your freshman oh, year. Just your ah, freshman year. To get okay. them started. There you go. Okay. That would be it. Well, that's a foot in the door. There is, uh, there, what? We did pass, uh, what was this? Uh, $5 million college scholarship fund? I don't know if that's part of it or not. Maybe no, that's. I think that's like a uh, people put into an account, and then it can go towards that. It's it's not state funded. I'm not sure what it is, well, but it's not know. state that's funded. That's what I read in right. Senator Gita's well, Before I just want to touch on revenue and revenue loss by the town at the hands of the state, and <clears throat> just quickly. Not even want to talk about the shared revenue, which would have been almost seven hundred thousand that we lost. That yep. not going to talk about uh, some of the other bills that caused the state. Uh, the school, even more than that, was lost by the school. Hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that they didn't get from the state that drove the taxes up. But I'm wondering if, in your position, you be able to help us on something that we have, Councilman Kenny. And sent it the guy to helping us. Have you heard anything about Highland Street and lost revenue there? The state was supposed to give the town up to 1.1 million, Neil, in revenue uh, to do Highland Street this year, the fiscal year that we're in. And that's what we were told during the winter time. We came tied for first. They pay the top three. Late August, we found out that. We got moved out of the 10-year fiscal, 10-year uh, plan that they're in right now. This is the last year of it, this fiscal year. And we got moved into the next 10-year plan. And it wasn't for next year. We got moved up to 2027. So the senator and the councilman have talked to the board, and they are trying to do something about this. We thought we had good news a couple of weeks ago because they said we got moved up. Well, we have got moved up to 2025. <laughs> that million dollars... <clears throat> representing the citizens of this town cost $500,000 in revenue because we had $500,000 saved for Highland Street that we were going to be able to take out of reserve and put towards this year's budget, mm -hmm. to which now when we got notified at the end of what we can't do that. 
So on top of the shared revenue that we lost yeah. for yeah. almost 700, on top of what the school lost, which I believe is a number higher than that, and now another half a million dollars lost at Highland Street. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to explain this away to the citizens. I don't know in the course of your duties, you'll have a chance to look into that. And the history goes, and Steve, you would know that Highland Street was a state road given to the town, conditional of the big slabs of concrete, which go five to eight feet below the surface and are shifting all the time, were going to be replaced and repaired by the state. The state did phase one, and it stopped there. The citizens of the town raised money to skip over phase two and do phase three down by Hannaford. Mm -hmm. And for the last seven years, I've been trying to advocate the state coming back to the table and paying phase two. Mm -hmm. Starting three years ago, they said that they would, and they put us into the 10th year mm -hmm. of this year's plan, which is now 15 years since right. this happened. It's so almost ready to repair phase one. Mm -hmm. And we came in tied for first. Until and we have been moved up to 2027 and now dropped down to 2025. It's not going to last. The road's in failure now. Oh, I know it is. I just drove in on it. Um, State reps are kind of at the bottom of the totem pole. No, and I know that, but I'm just saying, but in your passing, eventually but, you all yeah. sit at the same table, whether it's at lunch or coffee, but when you're down in Concord, this was a state road. That This, oh, this yeah. wasn't like how the rest of that plan goes. So it was a state road, and they turned it over to the town, but the assumption was, or the deal was, that they were going to. Because of the concrete slabs underneath, just like Main Street has them. Yeah. And I don't remember the size of them, but they're so many feet. And they shift. And the reason why we skipped over phase two, because phase two is flatter than phase one and phase three. And uh, it was supposed to be a three phase, done by the state, replace all of Highland Street. And we ourselves as a town did phase three. And I began with North Country Council advocating for phase two to be done by the state again and we were put in this year's 10-year plan, I'm sorry, the, the end of this year's, t because we came tied for first. Right. And then during the summertime, we received notice that, yeah. you know, after going to March meeting, after using the half a million dollars as an offset for the budget that we're in, that we weren't going to get the $1 million. So Joe, Kenny, and, and uh, Senator Guida, have been working with DOT on this? We've, we've talked to Bob and Joe both, and, uh, you know, it, n nothing, I mean, we were at 27 now it's down 25. to 25, and, uh, you know, we're still um, <clears throat> still working with Senator Agata on it. Well, um, what's worse than that, in all honesty, is being told that the process that we went through doesn't even count. Mm -hmm. yep process that we were made to go through over the last seven years through North Country Council doesn't count. The, right. the state trumps that process. So mm -hmm. why do we have to, for seven years, go through the process when we should have just been down in Concord yeah. fighting for something? I know the only time I saw something really get to the top of the list was when Ray Burton used to have those uh, TAP meetings, the transportation 10-year plan meetings, and he'd have them. And I remember one day coming here <coughs> for, and I can't even remember what it was about, but, and, and then going to Laconia on the same day, and a whole group of people for different things were going to all the different meetings. You know, because mm -hmm. I was there about uh, widening or paving 3A <coughs> uh, in Hebron. And uh, at the end of the whole thing, Ray said, okay, so he said to DOT, you have to figure out what this is going to cost. But, I mean, it takes, you know, it takes masses of people going and, like, but they don't have those meetings really anymore. And I was part of that, and that yeah. was seven years ago. Yeah. And then that's when Ray got me in touch with North Country Council. <coughs> and started I was on the board of directors for... Where's Ray? For three years up, and then we lost Ray, and it started to slide. Yeah. Yeah. Neil took my place as a board of director. We finally, which this should have happened three years ago, and then right. two years ago, and then it was definitely we came in tied for first. Yeah. yeah. And 
Well, yeah, I'll reach out to Bob and see what he's got up his sleeve, if anything, and you know, and I can call the. Yeah. And, and again, when the town, the towns that we're competing against, in my world, don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to this particular issue. They've got born, ingrown problems that many they've created themselves. Mm -hmm. This was a state road that yeah. we took yeah. over. And we also, uh, Yatton Road's a state road. We maintain Yatton Road mm -hmm. for the state. We do a lot of things in this town for the state. Uh, that was their road. Right. Hmm. And if they could just make good on why they gave it to Plymouth to begin with. It's a... <clears throat> yeah. So that goes back, what, 20? More, More 20, than 30 years ago. 30 yeah. years ago, yeah. right. More than 30. All the players, of course, are <laughs> long departed. And that, <clears throat> they're all gone. Island Street has serious hydrology problems and the infrastructure is failing and and so they're ripping up the road and patching it and, and yeah. they're, they're cutting through the concrete and it's it's really and, and we have a misaligned intersection and it's a very important intersection where the, you go in the school mm -hmm. and the alignment right. with Reservoir Road which yeah. is heavily traveled. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's another. We're not going to let you go. <laughs> I, I get, got that impression. I was like, yeah, go there's to another I'm issue. In. <laughs> there's another serious issue that we've been really pounding on for a long time in our planning process, and that is the safety on Tenney Mountain Highway. That and w it's it's already overburdened with yep. traffic. It's a main truck route from Montreal and Burlington to Boston and yep. and Portland, and. Uh, the, the traffic is, is just in, incredible and, and we have all kinds of problems with access on that road mm -hmm. and the accident rate is in the hundreds of accidents out there and uh, we just know that we're about ready to have maybe some more more uh, construction out there you know it, 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 there's some percolation going on mm -hmm. and uh, it, uh, the the uh, I know the water and sewer department knows that uh, there's going to be development out there and uh, that that highway needs to have the attention of the DOT engineers if we can just get them to start analyzing the problems that we have out there we've done studies I thought about 10 years ago there was the proposal to put roundabouts in instead of all the traffic lights that was discussed yeah, we've, we've yeah. done and more recent studies. Instead, we went with the traffic lights, yeah. which is... I don't think they're going to put... I think it was mess. a DOT call. Yeah. You know, oh, they, okay. I thought it, it was... And they changed. Road, yeah, rotaries were popular, and then lights. It, so. Yeah. I guess lights are cheaper. Suicide lane. <clears throat> well, yeah. It's scary. So going way back, you know, when I was on the planning board, which is 100 years ago, we were talking... I was on it with you. We were talking about, we were talking about service roads. Yeah. Or uh, yeah. service. Oh, on the planning board, we're still talking about that. Still talking. About <laughs> that. Wow. Sure. Yeah. Service roads, like, is probably the ultimate answer. Yeah. yeah. You know? Local, local traffic cuts. off, off yeah. the beaten path. There. Well, the, the traffic load is only going to increase. Right. It's already terrible. bad. <clears throat> so, if you know anybody on the transportation committee, or or public works, I don't know who's going to handle it, but you know they need to be informed. They need to know that we have issues there, and even if the DOT doesn't want to hear it, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think you know a lot of it has to do with money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It all has so. to do with money. I'm telling you right now, it all has to do <laughs> yeah. with money. You no, know, like every don't want every every accidents. problem that we no. have talked about tonight but eventually the, comes down to the question that the state doesn't have any money. Yeah. But the first energy but. infrastructure corridor is has been applied to be used. You know the bill that um, we passed that would enable lines to be buried along 93 oh. and 101 oh, and 95 and Liberty Utilities 89. has put in a 89 right an application no on uh, 101 oh. between the seacoast and Manchester okay. so the that's the first that could be the first use of those corridors and the state will get the money for the lease mm -hmm. so there'll be a little more money in the highway department. <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and just then, a little quickly on the our, on the rights based ordinance thing. So along with the rights based ordinance, the local ordinance, uh, my committee is hearing um, 
the um, CACR 19, which is the which is the enabling legislation uh, for the so it's constitutional uh, amendment uh, concurrent resolution, and it is about uh, and it requires a two thirds. It's three fifths majority uh, to pass. It's a serious long shot, uh, but um, if any of you are interested in supporting that when this thing gets exact, or as you have an opportunity to write to my committee and express your interest in having that enabling legislation, uh, that would be good. And we'll talk about it some more at this uh, I mean. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight, and yeah. thank you for your service. I mean, yeah, thank you. Thank you. You, know, thank you. Uh, you guys got a tough job, and you know, <coughs> come again. Everybody wants your ear, and so. And if you could just stay a little while and help us through Kino. Well, <laughs> oh, I was going to ask about Kino. Yeah. Should we get a speaker's a presentation? Now, yes. You'd like to. Okay. So if you could just stay and help us and <coughs> guide us through that. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. Have passed All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. We appreciate if, it. If Our there are bills wants. that catch your eye, you have questions about, drop me a quick email. Call me. We'll thank do you. it. Go down to Steve Store and harass him. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. He makes yes. us buy something though before he talks to us. <laughs> All right. Okay. Next is Maura McCann. Mind if I use a podium? No, that's fine. So I can see everybody. All right. Thank you, uh, Maura McCann. I have been with the lottery um, well over three decades. I have a very fun job. I enjoy my job every day. Uh, I do the marketing, the advertising, the public relations work for the lottery. So I'm very well versed in lottery, well versed in uh, Kino fairly well versed in government, learned a lot uh, this evening. That was very interesting. So uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to kind of take a look back, um, bring you to where we are now with Kino and uh, what our future looks. Uh, what's interesting about uh, the lottery in Kino is back in 1964, we were actually the very first legal lottery in the United States. So New Hampshire started it all and now there are well over 46 lotteries within the United States. Um, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, all of the territories of Canada, and of course over in Europe, but um, here in New Hampshire is where it all began. And it actually was proposed over a 10 year period five times from 1953 to 63 and it failed each time. And it wasn't until 1963 when a state legislator by the name of Larry Pickett from Keene, he said, hey, let's earmark the net profit from the sale of tickets to fund education. And that was actually the turning point. Uh, the legislation passed. Uh, there was a special ballot that was sent out to the towns and cities here in New Hampshire. And the ballot was specific to asking the question as to whether or not lottery tickets would be on sale in their city or their town. So there were well over 200 back in 1964. And of those 212 or so, 11 said no to lottery tickets being sold. So here we are well over five decades later and Kino has been proposed a number of times and not successful, but yet once the funds from the sale of Kino, the net profit was earmarked to fund full day kindergarten once again, that was the turning point. The legislation has of course successfully passed. Governor Sununu has signed it into state law and part of that law says once again, as only New Hampshire can do, very democratic state, it's in the hands of the residents, the voting residents in the towns and cities to say yes or no as to whether or not Kino can be on sale. This past fall with the municipal elections, 
Seven out of the 12 cities said yes to Keno. At this time, we have about 45 locations statewide. We're all the way from Berlin over to Claremont, down to Nashua, back up to Manchester, Franklin, Laconia, Summersworth. Did I forget somebody? I don't think so. Um, but we're at about 45 locations. Um, this week alone, we just surpassed $900,000 in Kino ticket sales since December 15th. What comes next? And here I am in the beautiful town of Plymouth tonight. Um, the town meetings, and that's the next opportunity if the selectmen do vote to allow it to be on the town warrant to allow the city, excuse me, the citizens of Plymouth to say yes or no to have um, Kino on sale here. You actually have about 17 locations that qualify to sell Kino. Again, um, the state law is specific to allowing pouring establishments. Pouring establishments meaning that they are licensed by our Liquor Commission. So you have 17 locations right here in the town of Plymouth. And what also is interesting is that lottery ticket sales, they tend to kind of follow population. You know, I hear constantly, nobody in the North Country wins on big lottery tickets or everybody in the, in the southern part, Nashua, uh, Manchester, Salem, you know, that's where all the winning tickets go. Of course, we have no control over as to where the winning tickets go or not. But population, the ticket sales as well as the number of people who win follow population. What's interesting about Kino is that it's not quite following that diagram. Our number one Kino location is a little spot in Summersworth, New Hampshire called Two Doors Down, and they are leading the way with Kino sales. So we talked to them and said, what are you guys doing? You know, why are you number one? And why is a location in Manchester or Nashua not number one where there tends to be population? Two Doors Down said to us, well, we're just down the road from a, a manufacturing plant that runs 24-7. And when they get off the shift, they stop by, they have something to eat, they have something to drink, they play a few games of Kino, and they're, they're you know, off to go home to sleep for the rest of the night or to start their day or that sort of thing. So uh, Two Doors Down is our number one Kino location. Prior to Kino being offered here in New Hampshire, we reached out to our sister lotteries and we asked those lotteries that offer Kino, you know, what does it mean for the businesses in your state? And they said, what it means is that the places that offer Kino, they actually see a bump in overall sales. They have reported up to 20% more in sales of perhaps some beverages, food, and that sort of thing. What happens when they offer Kino is that the wait staff actually gets to, they tend to be tipped a little bit better. When somebody wins at Kino, they tend to tip a little bit better. So Kino is actually very good for businesses here. Now that we have it on sale here in New Hampshire, since December 15th, we've actually gone back to a number of businesses. And we've said, you know, what has Kino done for you? And it, it's almost like a mirror image. They're saying, overall, our sales are up. It brings people in, and we love the game. The game of Kino is very much like the games that you hear about a lot that we offer, Powerball, Mega Millions, where a player chooses a certain amount of numbers to play, their lucky numbers. They choose how much they want to bet, and then they choose how many drawings that they would like to be in for. The difference with Kino is that it is actually on sale 24 seven. However, drawings occur every five minutes. Drawings actually start at 11.05 in the morning and they end at 11 o'clock at night. So unlike Powerball, Mega Bucks, Mega Millions, where we have only two drawings a week, Kino is kind of a rapid fire game. It has drawings every five minutes. The lottery actually provides all of the hardware to these businesses at no cost. Um, there is a lottery terminal that's in these pouring establishments. 
and there's actually a self-service machine that we put in so we certainly don't want to burden the wait staff with processing any bets so players go up and they place money in this self-service machine they choose what they would like to play and a ticket is automatically printed along with that we provide marketing advertising we provide uh, posters we provide kino caddies which hold play slips as well as the pencils to complete the play slips um, we provide kino signs and we certainly provide tv as well as radio advertising in return an establishment does pay a 500 dollars a year annual fee to be a kino retailer what we've seen from where kino is on sale now uh, the average sales commission is about $300 a week at these locations. On a dollar Kino ticket sold, the establishment actually gets eight cents on that dollar, 8%. It's the highest in the United States. When you go into one of the mom and pop stores or perhaps one of the chain convenience stores and you see Powerball or one of our scratch tickets on sale, that sales commission is at 5%. So although these establishments are selling Kino at the time, there is going to be expansion for them to be selling our other products. But again, Kino is at 8%, the highest in the country. We actually have a sales piece that we provide. It's, um, it's about two feet by two feet, which is the size of that self-service machine. And what we have projected is that on average, an establishment can make $14,000 a year in just sales commissions alone from selling Kino. At this time, um, our sales projections are ahead by about 15 to 20%. Um, we're happy with how Kino is selling. I have a leave behind for the selectmen to just take a look at at your leisure. I'll leave my business card and you can certainly call our office if you have any questions beyond this evening. But for right now, I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. If I could just go first. And before the selectmen vote one way or the other, it's just some housekeeping on how, I have the town clerk is here tonight. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure that with a window of opportunity, which is very short now, to get it before the people on whether we would do it on a Tuesday night on uh, the election. Your town or, meeting. Or Wednesday at the town meeting. Oh, you have your town meeting on Wednesday. Right, right. The elections are on Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month. Town meeting is the second Wednesday of the month. So if the uh, Board of Selectmen vote to put it on the town warrant, um, at those at the town meeting on Wednesday is that when you would vote on your on the warrants that have been approved that's what I'm at. can it be a ballot vote on a Tuesday you know that point when I said I was well versed on everything but state government <laughs> you have stumped me I'm sorry but I will have the answer to the town clerk tomorrow I promise okay. everything that I have been told is that at the town meeting that it can be voted upon I unfortunately I'm, I apologize I don't know about the ballot on the Tuesday before so most of our town meetings are March 13th so here in Plymouth same same March 14th is your town meeting on a Wednesday though a Wednesday. and the vote would be okay I promise to have an answer to you tomorrow okay. any other questions from anybody Oh, yawning. I do have a question. Would the um, select board vote this evening to put it on the town warrant or not? I, I, would, I would ask the select to discuss and vote. Oh, there's another window, right? <clears throat> and when we have to have a public hearing? That's right. 15 to 30 days before you would vote upon it. Correct. So. We've got what the meeting on the twelfth. Had one scheduled. Kino, Kino, Kino. 
And the reason why I asked you that quick, we get a yeah. larger representation at the booths on a Tuesday. At 12. Then we might. And I will have an answer to you tomorrow. Thank I, you. I guess I do have a question. Sure. Um, has law enforcement um, been receptive to it after it's, since it's been in place for two or three months, or are they, were they receptive at the beginning and now not, or they weren't and now they are? How does that play out? No, I, I, I have to admit, I did not hear law enforcement weigh in prior, nor have I heard any issues since. Um, in the past, they've weighed in on offering a casino here in New Hampshire and that sort of thing, but nothing, nothing regarding Keno, no. So our, our public hearing is going to be on February 12th right. at 6.15 p.m., and we're going to vote on whether or not to put it on the town warrant. <coughs> I don't know. We'll no. have to take a look at it. Okay. You can. That's a public hearing, John. Yeah, but but the select board would have to vote. You can move that public that public hearing. We can move it. You can if you want. It has to be between the twelfth and the twenty sixth, I believe. So we just need enough time in advance to post it in the newspaper. When's our right select now? board? Uh, when do they meet? The twelfth. Yeah, so they would have to decide right. that. So your next meeting is the 12th. If you don't decide tonight, you need to decide on the 12th. Yeah. You, we won't have enough time to post a public We're hearing. We're have a public hearing on the 12th. Of February. You don't have to have a public hearing on the 12th. But oh. you would have to at least vote on it as a board by the 12th. Okay. That's the beginning of when you can hold a public hearing. Oh. Between the 12th and the 26th. Can you give me a moment so I can double check? That 12th is the first, is the next meeting, right? Yeah. The 12th and the 26th. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? No? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are the towns that have voted against it uh, used as a reason for not wanting to have Keno? Um, I can speak on behalf of the cities. Uh, Portsmouth voted against putting it on their ballot. Um, and the city of Lebanon, uh, they're a little different. Um, even though they're a city, they actually have elections coming up in March. And again, uh, from what I read in the newspaper accounts, it was a personal choice by the um, a few of the selectmen to say no to offering Keno. There was a concern over um, problem gambling and that sort of thing. So um, there was actually another uh, newspaper piece in the Valley News that said that uh, the residents are actually signing a petition in order to get it on the ballot coming up in Lebanon. So. Um, so I would imagine that negativity would come from the churches, welfare departments, thing that a fear out of people using their last five dollars to purchase a ticket. Um, I have not heard any of that. Uh, the of the twelve cities, again, Portsmouth said outright no that we do not want it on our uh, ballot for the residents to vote. Um, Lebanon was a little. Um, Again, their election cycle was a little off, even though they are still a city. Um, Rochester, uh, Rochester actually was a recount because uh, Keno was approved by one vote and residents asked for a recount and it was tied. So when it was tied, uh, it was not a win for Keno no. there. If we were to miss this window of opportunity with this upcoming March meeting or ballot, when would there be another window? Uh, one year from now. One year from now. Mm -hmm. If it was to pass in this window of opportunity, is there a retreat of vote a year Sorry, from? Can you retreat from this program? If the game went away, is what you're Does saying? Does the game have to go away? Once it's voted to be able to be in Plymouth, can it be undone at any point after that in the future? 
I do believe it would take um, state law change. That would be a state, state law, law change, right? Right. In order for the game to go away, yes. Wow. Any other questions? <laughs> Keep on going. Those are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess as a, as a landlord, I would I'd be worried about people not having money to pay their bills if what is the demographics of the people that are playing the games? Are they people with their last five dollars, or are they people that already have several hundred thousand dollars at their disposal of disposable income? Uh, it's certainly a very a, a blue collar person uh, who does purchase lottery tickets, therefore does play keno. Um, we do know that prior to offering Keno here in New Hampshire, that $25 million worth of sales um, was heading south into Massachusetts. So at the very least, we would like to retain that $25 million and keep it here. As for problem gambling, you're actually looking for, at the vice president of the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling. Um, in my marketing position and advertising for the New Hampshire Lottery, I have been invited to have a position on that board. And I work with wonderful people. And they have a very small budget that is provided by the New Hampshire Lottery, $25,000 a year. We have about uh, six people that show up at our quarterly meetings at New Hampshire Lottery headquarters. Um, the council has many in-kind donations from the lottery, from everything from printing of brochures to printing of business cards, letterhead, as well as doing a public service announcement regarding problem gambling here in New Hampshire. What's interesting about Keno is that 1% of the sales is actually earmarked for the Department of Health and Human Services to perhaps I guess, for lack of a better term, pay attention to any problem gambling that is occurring here in the state of New Hampshire. Um, I work with a wonderful <coughs> gentleman. The president of the council is Ed Talbot. Um, Ed is actually the person who picks up the telephone when somebody needs help 24-7, 365 days out of the year. And although he, he shares some statistics here in New Hampshire, um, as to uh, really who or what accounts for problem gambling, um, lottery is not at the top of the list. It was more um, sports betting, dog, horse racing, and that sort of thing, as well as um, going out of state to the casinos and that sort of thing. But um, lottery is not at the top of the list. So Ed writes out checks for their rent if they can't cover rent. I don't believe so, no. Okay. John? Paul? Oh. The, who bears the cost of the collection of the money that's raised by Keno? Does the state come through town? So uh, similarly, right now with the sale of lottery tickets, uh, the retailers have um, designated a bank account for the sale of those tickets. And once a week, the money is swept from those bank accounts by the New Hampshire Lottery. The net profit from the sale is uh, sent over to the Education Trust Fund, which is at the State Treasurer's Office, once a month. <coughs> once it's over there, it's up to the, the Department of Education to disperse it to the various school districts. So it's the business owner's expense that gets the money from their establishment they make the deposit right mm -hmm. into their bank account, correct. And they make 8%. 8%. Mm -hmm. How, sorry, John. I, no, Brian. How exactly does the Department of Education um, decide how much a town like Plymouth would get for their for the kindergarten? I can speak briefly on that just because of the research that I've done. There's actually a formula that they use that determines how much a particular town or city gets. But that's unfortunately, again, that's with the Department of Education. It used to be called the Augenblick formula. I'm not sure if they still refer to it as that. So they're that. not giving you the formula? 
Um, the Department of Education will provide that, yes. I do not know the formula off the top of my head. That formula has been in use for a long time. <coughs> yeah, absolutely, it has. You're absolutely correct. They talk about it back in the 60s, yes. Oh. So your board's window of opportunity has to be tonight or the 12th if you're going to use the local paper because you have to have your public hearing by the 26th but we won't be able to get our 10 required days into the public hearing notice for the 12th so i won't be i'm just saying if you don't vote tonight you have to vote on the 12th, the 12th. so that the staff can get it we can poll the select board i mean do you do you want to get a sense of the board right now, John? Well, I'm, uh, do you feel ready to vote one way or the other <coughs> at this point? Before we hear from business owners and yeah, the public. and your town clerk would prefer that sh you vote tonight. And we're voting. <laughs> we're <laughs> voting just to put it on the ballot, <laughs> so that it's, it's, it's a ballot. Uh, so the citizens still voting. Oh. There are things that we have to do as your staff to make sure that we can pull it off in time, including I printing. Should, mm -hmm. I think we should uh, go ahead. I think we'd, we should vote, but I think we should have enough discussion so that okay. we can flush it out. And the good thing about it is your legislative body is going to decide. You're not going to ultimately decide whether it is in print right. or we just decide it, if it's going to be. You can we're going to well, you can do that right now. You can vote not to do this. We still have an open question about whether or not we can put it on the warrant article. You know, uh, or does it have to be? Well, well I and, and I won't have that answer until tomorrow. It's, it says it depends, of course, if a town has adopted the official ballot SB two form of town meeting, all questions must go on the official ballot. But no, we're not. No. We're not. That we're not doesn't pertain SB2 to us. Town, the question may be, but is not required to be placed on the official ballot. This is because the new law specifies <coughs> the form of the question and says that it will be voted on a ballot, but does not use the term official ballot. So, looking at that. And that's the ambiguity that you're dealing with, and that's why we can't get an answer tonight. Yeah. Okay. So, if you're looking for like a. Uh, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying I, what I'm what I'm asking the board. D do we feel like you're ready to vote one way or do you have enough information? Well, you know, I'm I'm not. I have no preference one way or the other is for this proposal. Okay. We can we can. But I think that we should allow. We, we should move forward and 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 make it possible for the citizens to vote on it. Okay. So I think we, you have to make a motion to, to make a motion to do and this then have a discussion. But, well, yeah. Okay, I move that. Uh, well, what? Uh, I'd like to make. Motion? I'd like to make a motion to. Okay, you make a motion to allow um, the citizens to vote on this at our election, uh, you know, through a, a town warrant. Uh, versus, I don't think we have to do versus, but I don't want to see it at a town meeting. You know, I want the town to vote on it. So the whole town rather yep. than the hundred. The so if we are going forward with a with um, you know the consideration of Kino, it shall be on the town warrant. On the ballot. On the ballot. <clears throat> on Tuesday. And if that's if that yeah, can happen, Tuesday. then and the re reason why I'm I'll, I'll second your motion. The reason why I'm clarifying that is because you could have a ballot vote on a March meeting also. True. Okay. And yep. so I just want, yep. I just but, want but to be on, clear. Yeah, but the on thing Tuesday, is, there Tuesdays. there might be a hundred and twenty people that would make the right. Decision. But if you're going to make a motion and call it a ballot vote, well, that can get confused with the ballot votes well, that we have at a March meeting. Is that okay, Town Clerk? A ballot. Well, I, I really do need. We do need the uh, the correct answer for certain because there's only certain things that are allowed hmm. to go on a town the official town ballot. That being candidates and um, actually that's that's just about it there's there's usually not a special exception which is well, the concern the that zoning yeah. ballot which is a separate ballot so the official ballot is really kind of true yeah. I didn't know if this was something above and beyond those rules for the official ballot. Okay. and so that's my curiosity and that's the fear that the three of us have that if we do that there are very few things that are allowed on the Tuesday vote. Mm -hmm. 
and are we eliminating a whole group of people that really would like to have some kind of say in this and if you limit it to just one way now yeah. yes if it can be done on Tuesday everybody has a chance yep. right if you just limit it to it's Tuesday or nothing then it might be no one has a chance so we can say and or if, if in other words in other words we we would we we would approve it going forward on the official ballot or as a warrant at right, the I, town meeting. I have a sense that your preference would be first to do it on a Tuesday. Yeah, right. exactly. And then if that doesn't happen, there may be another option too, that we could bring it to the voters at the March meeting to discuss it, where everybody can give some view with the thought of bringing it up for a vote the following, the following year. year right which that has a chance to flush it out because I have n I've heard a lot more than anybody else in the town with the exception <coughs> of us I've never played it but I don't have an opinion one way or the other I really it doesn't matter I'm just afraid that people will go in and vote really not knowing the background and not knowing enough information to just show up and vote cold well I mean I mean you know they know about the lottery they know about this and the basic difference is this has a drawing every five minutes and they may not know that showing up to vote on tuesday hmm? they they won't know that information showing up tuesday well, to just vote. Yeah, we do have six to seven have weeks hearing. to get this yeah. information well, out we're going to have a public hearing <clears throat> so i mean that information public hearing is meant to allow residents to ask questions about the game I do happen to have the state law in front of me and part of it does say in a town the question shall be placed on the warrant of an annual town meeting under the procedure set out in RSA 39-3 and shall be voted on a ballot. So that's well, even yeah, that's still, uh, we take a ba we do ballot votes at yeah. the town meeting. Mm -hmm. so. But then again you've got a smaller group of people that are Right, but you, but we do have one articles that do specifically require a ballot vote. Yeah. Correct. So, so maybe we'll have more people turn out at town meeting. <clears throat> well, isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't laugh. Said the person who grew up in a city and did not get to attend town meetings. So. And, and it should be, but in all honesty, we won't have more than one third of the representation of the citizens that vote in this town. If it happens, I'm surprised it wasn't set up in a way that it could yeah. definitely, without a f and any doubt, be done at a Tuesday. And that's what makes a small town so unique is that everybody can show up. Maybe I, I don't anticipate having a whole lot of people at a town hearing on this because there's no feeling strong one way or the other. I'm, I'm just guessing. But at town meeting, I, I think that's kind of the unique part about a small town is that people get up and speak and it's kind of what makes us special. Well then if that's the case, a public hearing and a town meeting combined should be enough to decide this matter. Or yeah. modify your motion. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to go in that direction, but, you know, if there is no well, other way, and that's well, what state law well, says, can't then... can't we put and or? I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you check it out and you're going to get with her to see if it... We will have an answer tomorrow morning. For yeah. Me, yes. So we could say <clears throat> yeah. on, on a ballot, and if not possible, then um, on a warrant... At town, town meeting. Town meeting. <coughs> yes. You got your motion? That's the motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We got Mike's vote. Well, those opposed? Do we, do we have a opposition? Oh, those opposed? No. Okay. So I do have uh, just two questions. I do have some leave behinds. Is anyone interested in them? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then moment. you guys had a great donut shop right here on Main Street where it baked. Whatever happened to that wonderful donut shop years ago? The they best retired, donuts. They retired. Oh, they retired. The yeah. best cookies. I would make a, a trip we from north. Sweden. And I would swing <laughs> off the highway just to come to that donut yeah. shop. I miss it. They sold lottery tickets and were able to leave. <laughs> <laughs> they won on a lottery <laughs> ticket and they were able to leave. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for putting up with That's me. That's why they're in Florida. But thank now. you for 
<laughs> Thank you for waiting. It. We no, appreciate it. Enjoyed it very much. And uh, yeah, my coworkers have advised me to drive slow south on 93. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, my yeah. uncle used to drive up from Springfield, Mass. <coughs> to buy sweepstakes tickets. Mm. Oh, and that was probably before. That was the yes, beginning. Because we were the first. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We used to do that too. To go to the liquor <laughs> store. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> liquor <laughs> store. You had to go to Ayers <laughs> Insurance, was it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. We got something to read. No, so you don't have to listen to me. Sometimes my. My uh, Thank brain you. gets ahead of my mouth and everything, but I hope I've uh, <coughs> we've all we've all experienced that. Yes, but I hope I've provided <laughs> you with enough information, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. <coughs> okay, let's see. What I do with you? Yeah, somebody though. else here. Yes, we have Experience something. Ah, uh, the assessor. <laughs> <coughs> Gary Fournier to explain the abatement for Gerald oh, yeah, that's why you're Tonus and Plymouth Woods. <coughs> <coughs> yes, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, I'm here because you have two abatements to consider. Right. One of them, I think, has come to the board previously, and perhaps some members had questions. Mm -hmm. regarding it and um, to be honest I'm glad that uh, there were questions raised because when I went back and reviewed it uh, I re realized that I had made a, an oversight and uh, so I've been able to correct that um, I think you have uh, you have in front of you first here we have a minor one uh, okay Plymouth it, Woods it's in the is it in the sign up? It's in it's the back of your folder. It's in yours. Yeah, you have the original thing. copies, John. <coughs> oh, all right. The rest of the board has copies of the recommendations. Oh, okay. Got both of them. Okay, so the Plymouth Woods abatement is the one that has mm -hmm. come to you before. Yes, this thick and one uh, that is based on the percentage. Yes. The wall heater. It's okay. It's substantially less. Of a system, so you must. Wh which abatement well, are you reading about? Tenny Brook Village. Okay, that's the that's the other one, I guess. We're on oh. the, no, no, the one when we were looking at was Plymouth, Plymouth Woods. Yeah, the the second page. Plymouth Woods. That's a formula. Yeah, they're calculating it based on ten percent of the actual income, and the question was, is that the rental income or is it? the total income, including any subsidies? Um, <coughs> the short answer is it does not include subsidies. Um, so it's 10% of what the residents pay. Well, <laughs> there's some rental <coughs> assistance that actually is included in the allowable income. Um, <coughs> some is so, and some isn't. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a so, bit. So all the income isn't reported? No. No. Here. That's correct. So um, it's the way it's, it's phrased ten, it's is ten percent of the reportable, it's which in, means income, some rental assistance income and um, some assistance. If they have other income from like vending or or laundry services, that sort of thing. Okay. We can't uh, tax them on government subsidies. Right. Okay. Um, I actually provided a copy of the statute mm -hmm. um, in the main packet there. Uh, that spells out in great deal detail what um, can be counted as the income and what cannot. Um, they actually, their income for the past year was actually bumped up because they got a refund from a previous abatement from mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Um, that is not so that is not allowable income. Two fifty seven five fifty four is the f actual figure. Two fifty seven five fifty four is the actual figure. That's so the actual so income. So their property tax would be twenty five seven fifty five. That is correct. 
instead of the 33 33,042 yeah. is what yeah. they actually paid. So it's abatement of $7,287. dollars correct. So what were they asking for? In in our they, they did not ask. I just realized that we had, I mean, they, they asked to be assessed under this statute, okay? Yeah. And once they're um, approved for that, and basically the, there is, the town doesn't have any discretion whether to approve. So your initial... If they're eligible and they apply, they're going to be assessed under that statute. So your inis initial um, calculation said that they should be paying what for 2017? They paid... Uh, Thirty-three thousand oh forty-two. They paid that in taxes. That is correct. Okay, but uh, I I think I explained in the. I just don't have the old paperwork in front of me that they that you wanted us to sign off that night. Original paperwork. I explained that, um, in order to determine how much their final tax is. Um, how much the bill will be actually sent out for um, I have to wait until the tax rate is set and I miss that window between the tax rate being set and the bills being sent out which was very very oh, brief okay. um, that's why it was not correct for the second tax bill okay and so this is just to correct that oversight okay so it's a, it's a little bit tricky because uh, Basically, you know how much their tax bill needs to be total based on their income, but you have to back into their assessment after you find out what the tax rate is. Okay. So, so I have a question. Um, the gross income based on what? The laundry and the, the rental and the rentals That's is two hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred and fifty four that's correct what was that gross income before the laundry was included um the laundry is a relatively small amount <coughs> in the hundreds okay so so this gross income <coughs> the two fifty seven five fifty four really didn't change it was the tax rate that changed but that's pretty much the same number that you brought to us a few weeks ago, correct? Um, as I said, there, I found an oversight. There was actually a subsidy, a credit, uh, what was it called, a, uh, an interest credit subsidy that I had included in their income. And when I phased that out, the, that lowered the number. So the number's lower than what it was? and was brought to you a couple of weeks ago. So this is a lower number. That probably won't happen again, huh? Well, hopefully not if we <laughs> if we can coordinate between, you know, in the within the office so that we But then the tax amount that they should pay went up because you applied the new no. No, the new tax it didn't rate go up. No, the originally tax. they were assessed at like 32,000. It's about and 7 or 8,000 dollars. And what happened is they were assessed on on the the property value, which and that came to thirty two thousand. Then they requested the ten percent fee, which lowered their taxes to twenty five seven fifty five, requesting an abatement of seven thousand two hundred and eighty seven dollars. Is that right? Oh man. Well. No. <laughs> no, okay. Okay. no right. not quite. Um, they applied to be assessed under this program a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. okay. The 33,042 is based on half of last year's tax bill, basically. Oh, okay. Like anybody's taxes are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> and yeah. that same number applied against the new tax rate. Okay. for the second bill okay and because the tax rate went up dramatically yeah that was a high number and that number couldn't go up because it was based on their income on a 10 percent right. of their income okay. calculation okay so so basically by doing this government subsidy that they're enrolled in it allows them to um, 
it allows them to not include government subsidies that they get into their pocket that they get out of paying the town for property taxes um, I mean that's before this statute was passed I think I explain in the uh, the new submission here yeah. um, it was very unclear how these types of subsidized low-income housing projects should be assessed and so the legislature passed this statute to clarify that it says you and shall they, not. they clarified that uh, you cannot count uh, government subsidies and such as income for purposes of assessment and that's a policy decision that the, the legislature made basically to uh, I suppose encourage low-income housing how many units are there um, I, I don't remember for sure but I think it's 52. four there are four separate buildings with four units in each one I believe so, so 16 16 units that sounds about right I, I don't remember a lot of kids. Right. I see the school bus there. <laughs> okay. Um. Do we have any questions on this one? I think I'm done. And everybody understands, yeah. and so we just need to go ahead and sign. <clears throat> so basically, it's a matter of getting the calculation right based on their income. <laughs> And hopefully I've we supposed that to effort. sign this all there are two places you have to sign I see a little I see a little red one here but I don't I don't know whether it got moved so Gary as I understand it <clears throat> they have a base income of 257,554 divided by 16 units then divided by 12 months <clears throat> I'm not using my so my favorite calculator but it looks like it comes out to one thousand three hundred and last time so you're all forty one dollars I did see a signature uh, so we're I'm using not sure what you're calculating uh, therefore based on the gross income of two fifty seven five five four for the previous calendar year the property tax for 2017 should be twenty five thousand seven hundred and fifty five. Yeah. I mean, is that's the it's gross just, it's income? It's a straight calculation of ten percent of the gross income. Right. But that's. But that's not. That does not include government subsidies. Right. So that means, each unit, per month, is paying one thousand three hundred and forty one dollars for those units. Could that be right? I'm not sure what you mean, paying for. Um, so sixteen times one one thousand three hundred. So they uh, would be paying taxes of such and such of so thirteen hundred. I'm just trying to. I'm just doing a rough calculation of what the monthly rent is for each one of those sixteen units. If there are indeed sixteen units, there would be about thirteen hundred dollars a month. No, thirteen hundred a year. Mm -hmm. Two fifty-seven every for six months, right? <coughs> that does include yeah. some. It's a lot no, of it's fifty-three weeks. Okay, so that is some rental assistance. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, the the rates uh, for a project like this are written into their contract when they receive government subsidies to help with construction and so on. And I don't have those with me. <clears throat> now the next one, um, Penny Mountain. Wall heaters are not as valuable as baseboard. Yeah, this is a, uh, a condo at Tanny Mountain, uh, the Fintonis property. Um, mm -hmm. They came in, they actually bought the property recently and paid substantially more than it's assessed at. Um, I did go out and do a, a physical inspection of the property at their request and um, I did find one um, minor correction to the interior data of uh, the flooring um, and that resulted in a small adjustment so I had to correct that. Twenty dollars and seventy-one cents? 
Um, uh -huh. Well, I'm talking about so, the assessed value, not the not the taxes. Um, it's well, but like they're talking seven, about talking seven, about abating seven hundred yeah. bucks, mm -hmm. I think. What does that say? That's we have abated the amount of twenty dollars and seventy cents. That's just the taxes. Tax times yeah. the seven hundred dollars in valuation difference. So, well, carpets more than. What, what, what was the form? Yeah, I mean, though, part of their case was that they assumed that all of the other units yeah, well, were yeah. identical, basically. Yeah, yeah. And they're not identical. There okay, are some do we, differences. Do we have an, a motion to uh, approve the abatement for? I move that we approve the abatement Fentonis. for Gerald and Joanne Fentonis. Okay. We have a, a second. second. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I'll sign it and pass it around. Back to Josie, I guess. There's only four signatures. To make an issue over, John. We'll leave it alone. Mike didn't want to sign it? If you're not going to sign it, that's fine. We, just no, we only need three signatures. Have the opportunity. Okay. <laughs> Rebel. <laughs> <laughs> Am I finished? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Gary. Thank you for <laughs> staying around and yeah. taking care of you us. To see what we do. <laughs> helping us. Uh, I've actually sat on that side of the table before. <laughs> so hopefully you were educated in Keno and Thanks, now Gary. you're an expert. And, and you can interview your state representative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unfinished business. Big pardon? Unfinished business. Okay. Um, I have Mr. Fournier. What else do we have? Nothing else. That's oh. it. Okay. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Public comments? All right. You got <laughs> yours out earlier, all right? All right. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right.